Welcome back to the podcast. Before I get going too much today, I want to just welcome our new listeners. I'm so happy to have you here. You can find us on Facebook at Becoming the Channel, the podcast community. You can just search for that and we'll put the link in the show notes for you. And I also wanted to just remind you that there is still time to get in on the bundle that I have announced actually earlier this week when I took a look at some of the themes that have been coming up for my clients and my community. I decided to offer two things together. I've never done this before, but when you work with me, you privately, you are going to be able to go through a life between life reviews, which is a beautiful meditative and reflective experience of your life, of the people who you have influenced and the people who have influenced you, as well as the things in your life that were you to get to the end of your life before you ascend, you would have had the opportunity to review and to reflect on and to make sure that you've done the things that you promised to do when you came to this planet before you incarnated. And of course, you don't have to do that. You don't have to wait until the end of your life to figure that out. You can do a life between life reviews. And this is just a really precious way of looking at your life and looking at the things that you've left undone and put on the back burner and prioritized other things over them. Usually we do that, especially for our sacred calling, our, our highest calling. So that's one piece of it. And the, and the other piece of the, the bundle that I love to share with people is actually to teach you about your intuitive channel profile. And that involves a couple of assessments and uh, some time with me to really get to know how your intuitive channel works, what frequencies you're meant to be tuning into, and ultimately how you're meant to be expressing your highest calling in the world today. So if that's something that is important for you to explore at this time in your life, I want to invite you into that bundle. We'll, we'll have the link in the show notes for you. And there is special pricing through the winter solstice, which is December 21st, 2023, which is one of my favorite days of the year. So with that, and actually what we're going to be talking about today on the podcast is really something that has come up for me personally and professionally. And I will start by saying this, that every once in a while, have you ever realized something that's been right in front of your face from for years and years? That was actually what happened with me this weekend. It turns out, as you know, I, I work with accomplished intuitive and intelligent people. A lot of the people who come in and work with me are working as physicians, engineers, allied health professionals. We all, everyone who listens to this podcast and is in my community, most of us anyway, have advanced degrees. We are go-getters in the world. We are highly, highly accomplished people. And we also have this profound intuition that a lot of times when people come in and work with me, they've kept hidden and they've kept behind the scenes because they don't want their colleagues to think that they're weird or too woo woo, or they don't want people to lose respect for them or to misunderstand them. And that's totally understandable. I mean, after all, that's the world that we live in. For the most part, there are still a lot of question marks about people who express their intuition and, and how that works. And yet one of the things that I've seen over and over in the assessment that I give, the NEO, you've heard me talk about that before. That's actually part of the intuitive channel profile. But in the NEO, when we look at the, the factor scores and we look at the individual facet scores, what I see is that the people who are coming to me, in addition to being very, very bright, very intelligent, are also highly open to experiences. So they are highly imaginative. They challenge the status quo. They are lifelong learners. A lot of them are emotionally intelligent um, and actually beyond emotionally intelligent. They have quite a capability with recognizing, understanding, and even managing their own emotions and the emotions of other people. So all of those things I've known for a long, long time. And that's really what I've built my whole my whole business on, 
my coaching practice on has all been around intuitive, intelligent people. But here was something that was so surprising to me and so obvious to me this past weekend when I started looking at a pattern that I noticed had emerged. And it turns out that I have several people who work with me right now who are those things. They're intuitive and they are intelligent. They are accomplished. They've done great things with their their lives in terms of who they've helped and how they've been expressing their gifts. And they all have had some kind of either near-death experience or some other kind of life-altering experience that has shaped the way they view their world, their perspective, and how they live their lives. So I want to talk about that because, you know, I've been sharing a lot about pursuing your highest calling. And I have said that your highest calling sits at the intersection of your professional expertise and your personal spiritual gifts. And I actually think that there's a third piece of that as well, which is what your sacred mission is, what you're actually here for. But when people come into me and I'm only recognizing that they have this near death experience or these life altering events that have changed their perspective. That is usually why they have come into me because they're trying to make sense of the world since their world has shifted based on their personal experience with their own consciousness, with death, with, with facing the fact that they may not be here tomorrow. And I know many of us have that experience. But it seems to me for the people who find their way to me, find their way into my into my work and into my world, that there is a sacred calling that they are trying to tap into, that they are they're really ready to lean into, and they haven't quite been able to articulate it. It's kind of like a word that's on the tip of your tongue. And so I've gotten very curious about this because one of the things that I've recognized is I've worked with people who have had these life altering experiences is that they want to, there is part of there, there's part of themselves that really wants to just fit back into the normal world that wants everything to be the same as it was before. And that would make sense from a, just from a human perspective, we want things to get back to normal, I would say. And yet one of the great challenges of having a life altering event is that life can never be the same again. There is no going back. There is no going back. And certainly personally, though I've not had specifically a near death experience, in other words, I haven't had a physical experience that would have popped my consciousness out of my body and, and allowed me to see my life from that perspective. I've done so probably at this point, hundreds of times consciously and um, intentionally over the past 20 years that I've been doing this work in spiritual intelligence and consciousness development. And every time I do, I come back changed. I come back with new realizations and recognitions. I come back with new ways of looking at the world and thinking about things, new perspectives. And I can feel even myself kind of wishing that things could get back to normal. I just want things to be normal again. And yet there is, there is a psychological theory, I think, that we can use here to explain what's going on for those of us who have had that those life-altering experiences. And it is called cognitive experiential self-theory. And cognitive experiential self-theory, basically, the idea is this, that we all have a way of viewing the world. We all have a personal schema, a way that we see things based on our previous experiences, based on what we are taught whether it's in church or a temple or at home or wherever it is from the people around us. And then something happens. It could be a traumatic event. It could be a cross-cultural event. It could be going to a foreign country. It could be meeting somebody. But there is, there is something that happens in the person's life that creates the conditions for a new understanding of life, of the world to be experienced and the perspective to be changed. I can even think about as an example, years ago, I went on the trapeze for the first time and I was so excited to go, but there was definitely a before and after for me, a before going on the trapeze, having anticipated going on trapeze from, from the time I was a little girl, actually, 
Um, and then going through the experience of flying on the trapeze and, and swinging through the air and feeling the weight of my body as my hands gripped the, the bar, right? So even something as simple as that can be life-changing, game-changing. And then you get down from that event, you, you go home and you look around and while everything else is the same, you know that you are different. Sometimes in my observation, the people who work with me, who have had these life altering events, sometimes it takes a near death experience. And I'm not saying that they cause that necessarily, but there, I think that there are some people who are more prone to just recognize the, the change that occurs when you have an event in your life that is meaningful, that is that changes your perspective. Some of us are a little bit more willing, I think, probably to adapt and integrate that change into our, our lives. And that is actually part of the cognitive experiential self theory is just simply, what do I do with this event? Do I integrate it? There are some of us who are pretty adept at integrating events like that. And then there are others who would look at who would have the same event and even have a similar life changing experience and then leave the event and basically close the door to it and act almost as if it never happened, even though they cannot actually act as if it has never happened because it did happen and they remember every detail of it. But they try to make life as normal as possible in spite of having this life altering event that transformed them in some way. So that is cognitive experiential self theory in a nutshell. What do you do with the life changing event? Do you integrate it into your personal schema, how you view the world, how you live your life, or do you, I'll say, reject it? Do you close the door on it and pretend like it didn't happen? Just don't look over there, you say. And it's okay either way, but it is something that what I have found with the people who are coming in and working with me is that they have done the latter more so than they have done what I usually do, which is just take it integrated and move on recognizing that I am different and therefore the world is going to appear different to me and working with within that framework. And so the, what people wrestle with when they come in and work with me looks like on the surface, it can look like existential anxiety or depression. It can look like existential conundrum or existential crisis. It can look like kind of shrugging your shoulders and saying, I know I don't want to be on the gerbil wheel anymore at work, but I'm not sure what's next. So a lot of times what they're coming in with is this big question of what now, what next? Now that everything has changed, what now, what next? And sometimes it takes years to arrive at that point. And I really believe this, that those who have the cognitive ability, in other words, the intellectual capacity to compartmentalize that experience and move on with their lives and do the things, chop wood, carry water, as the Buddhists like to say, but chop wood, carry water from the old perspective, the, the perspective that they had before the event, even though in truth, they cannot really do that. They have to do their daily tasks and hold at bay the awarenesses they have from that life altering experience. I hope that I am making sense here. I know that this can be a little bit convoluted, but stay with me because at some point we'll be able to tie this up and into a big red bow and make sense of it all. And that actually is part of the, the challenge, I think, in having near death experiences, having other life altering events. Think about things like divorce, think about things like physical ailments cancer, car accidents, even spiritual retreats can create the conditions for a new version of yourself to emerge as a result of the event. Your consciousness shifts first. The first thing to change is actually your consciousness or your awareness during a life-altering event. Sometimes trauma is involved with it, particularly when we're looking at things like car accidents and divorces and and physical, some kind of physical trauma or health condition. And even I think sometimes the good things that happen or the things that you would qualify as 
you know, productive or non-threatening in some way can create kind of a trauma response, not by virtue of um, having had anything go wrong or anything like that, but just because it's such a reaction to something that was so different from anything you've experienced before. And the mind can sometimes experience that as a, as a trauma. And the point here is that everything that you've experienced around that event requires processing and integration. And when you don't process it, or when you don't integrate it and you compartmentalize it, you can hold it at bay for a little while. You definitely can, especially if you're very bright, but eventually it's going to emerge as something that's required for you to look at. You know, there's that old saying that, you know, you get, God throws a brick at your head, right? Sometimes those bricks, I think, come from those, those experiences that we've had that have changed us in some way. And we haven't integrated or even processed through what those experiences meant to us, which brings me to my next point. Carl Jung is a, psychologist from way back, of course, he was one of Freud's students. But one of the things that Carl Jung wrote about was the challenges of middle age. And I think he had like five tasks of middle age. And I don't agree with all of them. You can Google them if you're really interested in finding out what his take on that was. But one stood out, two stood out in particular for me. One is that we do, when we reach our forties, I'll just say, it could be earlier than this, but generally speaking, when a person reaches their 40s and they've accomplished everything that they've set out to do, they've gotten the great job, they've got the great bank account, they have all of the, the material requirements or the material goals are beyond what they even anticipated, really. But when you get to that point, one of the tasks is to make meaning of your life. And when that is the central focus, making meaning of your life and reviewing your life is another of the tasks, a life review, where you look back on your whole life and you try to make sense of things. You try to make meaning of everything that has happened from even conception until the present moment so that as you're making as you're making sense of it and then therefore hopefully making meaning of it you'll be able to turn your attention to becoming fully individuated in other words becoming your own person and i don't think that that until you have life experience and until you really truly process through your life from the through the lens of everything that i i've been through in my life has somehow contributed to who I am today. And it also begs the question of what is next for me. I don't think until you get to that point, you can really truly be your own person. I mean, we can have a sense of independence when we're younger, for sure. We can have a sense of confidence about the direction that we are headed. But I think that for the most part, this reflection in the middle years is really the invitation to become a fully, fully, functioning person who is in charge of themselves. In other words, regaining the self-sovereignty that you had before you incarnated. And so when we look at what Jung's tasks are, two of which I mentioned, which are to do a life review and then to make meaning of your life, and we juxtapose that with the, the reflection that I'm making today about the people who come in and work with me have these experiences, these life altering experiences that they haven't made sense of and haven't made meaning of. And that really becomes the, I'll say the fodder for what comes after that. It becomes the, the soil in which you plant the seeds for your future. It becomes the invitation for you to say, yes, and because of this and in spite of this, this is where I am. And this is how I'm going to be choosing to live my life now and in the future. And it offers the opportunity for you to be able to really look at what are my priorities now and going forward? What are the things that are most important to me? What are the promises, the secret promises that maybe even secret to me that I made before I even arrived here? before I even incarnated 
and how, what is the best way for me to pursue these so that when I reach the end of my life, I can be sure that I've accomplished, I've contributed in the way that I promised that I would contribute. And you've heard me talk about this in previous episodes when I, when I talked about um, really coming into my highest calling and recognizing the importance of the horse, the sacred horse in, in the work and creating a retreat center and, and things of that nature that are all you know in motion as we're speaking now and helping more people come into their own space as in their own identity as fully formed sovereign beings who are channels themselves. When I look at that aspect of how I've changed in the past, we'll say even 10 years, but it's been longer than that because I've been on this spiritual journey for over 20 years at this point. But when I look at the trajectory of my life, I do know that these salient experiences that I've had have shaped me and also have informed me about the direction that I am meant to go next. And that is what I think is so compelling about the people who find their way to me, who have had these near-death experiences or these salient experiences that have changed them in some way is that they haven't yet really truly processed through and integrated what those changes mean for them personally, what they mean for them professionally, and how those experiences have changed the trajectory of their lives in ways that they could not have predicted or controlled for that matter. And we can look at anything when we when we talk about life altering experiences, we can look at things like 9-11. We can look at things like the unexpected death of a loved one, the shocking things that we can look at miscarriages. We can look at children dying. There's like, I can't even tell you how many things that we can look at, but the key is that we have to look at them and we have to feel the experience of them and we have to make sense of them and integrate them in a way that advises and informs us on what is next. That is not the sole purpose for examining them and for, for deeply understanding them. In other words, you can do so simply to just integrate so that you can move forward. But I do find that when you have not integrated, when you do not have not made sense of it, there is a part of your consciousness that actually gets trapped or entangled in that memory. It's like a trauma knot that exists in your in your field. And until you pluck that trauma knot out of your bioenergy field, this beautiful field that surrounds you, until you do that, until you really truly look at it, examine it, and untangle the consciousness from that knot and restore that consciousness into your central core, there is going to feel like that there is part of yourself missing, part of your identity that has arrested in some way failed to thrive, or just feels generally stuck there, stuck, alone, isolated. And that really is the work, I believe, of actualization as you're leaning into your highest calling is to untangle those trauma knots, is to really look at the timeline of your life and examine deeply and reverently these experiences that you have, the making sense of, of your life doesn't just happen on a cognitive level, on an intellectual plane. No, it happens on the energetic and the etheric as well, because those trauma knots that exist in your bioenergy field. And by the way, if you've never heard of trauma knots, this is a concept that that I've talked about in my McKay actualization method that I have a certification program for. Uh, where I teach you actually healers and and helpers to identify trauma knots, untangle them and restore them to their own clients and to themselves as well. And I just share this with you because it is a new concept when we look at making sense of our lives, when we look at leaning into our highest calling, if we are not willing or able to untangle the experiences that we've gone through that have changed our lives, altered our lives, then what ends up happening, I think, is that we just keep repeating 
over and over and over and over again, because there is part of the consciousness that really does require attention, that does require focus to be reintegrated into the present that is caught or entangled in a past experience. So for the highly intelligent people, the creatives, the intuitives who come in, who are innovative in everything that they do, what they will say is that I just don't know what's next. I've done everything. I don't want to repeat the past. I don't want to keep creating the same thing. And it's not even creating at this point. It just is iterating or repeating the same thing over and over again. I want something new and I do not know what that is. That is a signal that it is time to do this deeper work on restoring those aspects of yourself that you have compartmentalized probably during big life events. And so all this to say, when we're looking at highest calling, which again is that intersection between your professional expertise and your personal spiritual gifts, and then your sacred mission, whatever that might be, when we look at that, we have to also look at what's stopping you from really stepping into your highest calling, from really expressing your highest calling. And what inevitably ends up happening is that then we have to look at these experiences, these life-altering experiences that have created the, created the tapestry of your life, but there are some knots in there and there are some things that you haven't integrated and you haven't made sense of. And that is, that is the work. One of my clients said recently, she said, this work is really hard. And I said, well, it doesn't have to be when you release the hard work paradigm, of course, but it does invite a level of focus and intentionality on your own life. The level to which you may not be familiar with or necessarily I won't use the word comfortable because that's not what exactly I'm looking for, but we'll just say familiar with this level of, of focus. Um, and to be able to sit in the emotion of it, to be able to sit in the, the experience of your past again, to make sense of these experiences and to reintegrate those parts of you who have been sort of left behind, as it were to fill in the holes and the gaps so that you can move forward as you're meant to in flow with creativity, with strength, with confidence, with all those things that you possess in spades, but this time from a very integrated and focused perspective. And by the way, that's not to say that you haven't done good work in the past. Of course you have, and you've done it in spite of, in spite of all of these experiences that you've had. In fact, some people would look at you and say, there's nothing wrong with you. You have such a perfect life. You have everything. And you might even look at yourself in that way because we do. We say, I have so much already. Why do I still feel this hunger inside of me? Why, do, why is something inside of me so insatiable? But that does re return to some of Jung's midlife tasks to review your life and to make sense of your experiences. It's to be expected. So rather than making us wrong for it, the invitation today is to be okay with it, is to examine it through the lens of curiosity and love and, and wonderment, fascination, rather than from the, from the perspective of there's something, there shouldn't be anything wrong with me. I don't have anything to be, to be worried about or concerned about, and yet dot, dot, dot. That is often the signal that it is time to do this deeper work. And I will say this, I was walking Cooper earlier today and I was thinking about what I wanted to say on this podcast. And the thing that came forward was that I think, especially for women in this culture, in Western culture, there's this emphasis on staying young, on youth. And even when we get into our forties, fifties and beyond, we still feel that tug of, I'm not as young as I used to be, or I want to be young or that wish to be young or that pretending to be younger than you are. And it kind of made me wonder if part of that illusion keeps us out of asking these deeper questions, keeps us out of really being reflective on how far we've come 
and on the events that make up the gestalt, the whole of who we are. It's almost like it's a distraction being young, pretending to be young, wishing to be young is a distraction from the deeper work. And it is something that is so embedded in our culture. You only have to scroll on social media to see the emphasis there. So I do think that we have a responsibility to look past the, the cultural and the societal influences and even the religious and familial influences and really get to the heart of things, really get to the heart of why you're here and to construct a, a story, to tell a story of your life that not only are you proud of, but that helps you make sense of what you're supposed to be doing next with your life. So when I realized this pattern of life altering experiences that often, that always seems to accompany these bright and accomplished people who come into my world, I was very excited by that. And you can go on my Facebook group and see, I had, I had shot a video, I think the same day I discovered it and I was so excited by it. And today I am still excited by it for sure, but I'm also very reflective of it because I know that this is, it's big work. It's not hard work, but it is big work and it is important work. And I think sometimes we mistake big and important work for hard work. And on the other side of it, on the other side of this big, important work, the work of reintegrating all of the aspects of who you are, your soul, so that you can move forward in a really beautiful way. Oh my goodness. That work is worthy of you. And I think it's way more worthy of you than it, than it is to just iterate on something that you've done before. Oh, and here's something I think noteworthy. I may be able to close on this. I don't know. We'll see on the other side what happens. But one of the noteworthy things that I've also noticed is that there are some people who come in and work with me with the intention of doing this big and worthy work. And then they bail out. They leave early. And, you know, I work with people who are honorable about their financial commitments, who enroll in their programs and pay their bills on time. And I know this probably goes out without saying, but it gets to the point here that the people who come in and do this worthy work at some point, there are, there are some of them who don't have a sense of duty to themselves and they don't have a sense of duty to anybody else, including me. And so they want to withdraw early from the work. And the interesting thing is that I believe that it's actually a deflection. I believe it's actually the point that they, that they leave is the point where we have gotten so close to the actual issue, the actual thing that needs to be addressed, that it, I'll say it freaks them out and they're not able to articulate it. And so rather than hitting it head on, rather than standing in it and saying, oh, this is really feeling uncomfortable for me. This is feeling really crunchy for me. They will just bail. And I don't have any judgment about it, but I do think it's very interesting. And I think that, I think that it, it speaks to the depth of the, of the life altering experiences that are being called up and being excavated to, to process. And I can't know the nature of those. I can only know that that is the pattern that I've seen. And so whether you choose to work with me or work with somebody else or do, do it on your own as well, just know that there always comes a point where you kind of back off. You want to take a breather or you want to just pretend like none of it ever happened and just go back to life as usual. That is the point. That is the precipice. You're on the precipice of the other side. There is a saying, don't stop three feet from gold. And so many people do. And so I always encourage you to just press on even when, and especially when you feel like stopping. So with that, I'm going to close for today. Thank you so much for joining me on becoming the channel, the podcast. If you found this helpful, enlightening, illuminating, I would love to invite you to leave a review on the podcast that helps us get the word out to more people. If there's somebody who you feel like needs to hear this, please share it with them. And if you're feeling extra, 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 you can always take a screenshot of the podcast, tag me in social media so I can share 
share it with my community and also say thank you for being part of my world. And until next time, I will see you then.